Dramatic developments in Russia on Friday and Saturday as Evgeny Prigozhin, chief of the Wagner Group, rolled into a southern city and was charged with inciting armed rebellion. Tensions and violence have escalated in Sudan and spread to Kaduli, the capital of the South Kordofan state, forcing more people to flee the conflict-ridden country. At first, it was just angry social media posts. In the V hours of Saturday, the Russian mercenary chief Yevgeny Prigozhin rolled into Rostov on Don, a city in southern Russia. His demands and goals are unclear, but he has gone beyond the usual provocative statements about Russia's military establishment. By Saturday, Russia took strong measures to keep him at bay. But it could be other parts of the world which feel the impact of these developments. Of course, this is a rapidly developing story and could change by the time you view it. But with what we know now, we speak with Prabhi Purkaista, Editor-in-Chief, NewsClick. Prabir, the chief of the Wagner Group has made many statements, many actions according to the report. How reliable are these reports which say that it's a coup and that, you know, he's a big threat to Putin? Well, I don't think it is a coup because Putin is still very much there and this is taking place in Rostov on Don. Therefore, it's not the major arena of uh, in and around Moscow. So that's one yes. part of it. Second part of it, is Putin is already on record saying that, you know, this is bogus and he has to uh, back off completely. And this is a, something which is essentially against the interest of the state. Apart from calling him traitor, he has virtually said everything else. Right. Okay? So that is that is very much there. Question is, who is Prigozhin and can it upset the Russian state? I don't think it can unless there are other breaks which we don't know about and there are inner fault lines which we don't know about. At the moment, he seems to be very much a uh, aberration. A, of course, should they have depended on this kind of formation, which is what the Wagner formation is. The Wagner is, I believe, how it's pronounced. The Wagner formation is. It's equivalent to what you had in uh, the US. You had also Prince, uh, uh, there was a Black, Eric Prince. Uh, right. The, 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 he had his private army which was used in Iraq and right. it con actually did uh, atrocities for which there was a lot of uh, publicity at that stage. But he continues to lead that uh, formation which is still there and it provides armed services in various countries which Wagner also does for instance in Africa. But having used them in the Ukraine uh, war, it's also true that in Bakhmut, for instance, he got a lot of publicity that he was at the forefront of the war. Not that he was a participant, but his forces were. And in Bakhmut, the publicity he got made him a figure in Russia. And we saw also that he started criticizing that they were not getting enough arms and ammunition. And the Russian army, some of the generals are not cooperating with him. So obviously, he felt that he had now achieved a status by which he could take on the, the army generals, the defense minister, maybe, all of it. In his statement, he has not directly attacked Putin, but he has attacked the defense minister. Okay. So that's where it stays at the moment. What his objectives are, is he, does he think there will be something which will cause uh, the Russian state to break down and make him the leader? All un unanswered questions at the moment. If you ask my personal opinion, I think it is significant because it shows cracks which we don't know about that is coming out. So yes, to that extent, it's important. Will it make any difference to what's happening between the Russia and Ukraine and NATO? I think not. Do, you, do I think that Russia will overcome this crisis? On the face of it, looking at what all we know, it seems to be yes, unless there is something which we don't know about and okay. there are factions within the Russian state which we have no idea about. Then, of course, it's different if he has allies which who then will come out later. So those are the imponderables at the moment. But looking at what Frigojin has been saying for some time, and we've been listening about him for the last three, four months, particularly in Bakhmut and his various vituperative attacks on generals and others, 
various comments that he has made, he seemed to be always a bit of a loose cannon. Yes. So at the moment, is it something which is the continuation of his behavior as a loose cannon? That is something we have to see. Or are there deeper fish, deeper fissures within the Russian state, which we don't know? It's the first manifestation of a fissure of this kind after Putin has taken power. So it's significant to that extent, even if it does not have a long-term impact. It is something which is going to create a certain degree of instability within the Russian state. So right. that, I think, is to be taken for granted. Yes, it's not a minor issue. But in terms of the stability, I don't think that's, that's going to be a significant issue, not on the face of it. Right, Rabi. What do you think about the timing of uh, this particular incident? Russia is still dealing with it, but the timing, is it is it going to impact? Could you elaborate on whether you think the impact on Ukraine could be significant as well, not just in Russia? You know, the interesting part is what he has talked about the Ukraine war flies in the face of all that we know about it at the moment. Okay. The new offensive right. we have already talked about even the Western media is today more or less admitting that Ukraine's thrust, this new offensive that they were supposed to have launched with uh, a lot of fanfare, with a lot of arms and weapons that had been given by the NATO countries, all of that doesn't seem to have played a major uh, role in making inroads into what right. the Russian held territories are. So, given that, the statement that Prigozhin made, oh, you know, there's a huge defeat. Yes. All, all this kind of statement doesn't seem to make sense. Again, there's so much of material that's today out in public domain, mainly because of the kind of channels that exist. Telegram, for instance, in Russia and Ukraine. You have also something you can see by satellite, a lot of the what is going on. So even private satellite images are available, yeah. which show a lot. So given this, I, it, it's very difficult to I, uh, understand why Prigozhin is saying, oh, they have broken through, this has happened, that has happened, there's been a disaster. Doesn't seem to square it with reality. If it did, we'd have heard it from all the leading bourgeois papers in the world. So the fact that the New York Times doesn't say it, Washington Post doesn't say it. Financial Times doesn't say it. In fact, all of them are taking a much more, much sober down position than they used to do earlier. Sure. So given that, I think this is again a part of Prigozhin playing to a gallery which we don't know about. Or the man is, uh, shall we say, not fully in touch with reality. Again, okay. difficult to say why a person is doing it. You can talk of True. larger forces. Individuals are not predictable. True. So given that, we don't know. But let's see what happens. I, the pictures that show, yes, that he has seemed to have occupied a particular military building in uh, Rostov and Don. So that is there. So I, I think that he has uh, done something. But the repercussions of this is what happens to him. That's not so important because I don't think he will go anywhere with this. But, you know, Wagner has a major uh, impact in Africa. It is providing security service to a number of states who have actually kicked out, for instance, French and other forces right. to provide those services which they are doing earlier. What happens to Wagner's role in Africa is again something we'll have to watch. It's there, I think, it is going to weaken Russia and Russia's play in terms of international politics. All right, Prabhi, thanks very much. And this is a story we'll be watching. The war in Sudan has already uprooted over 2.5 million people, but the fighting between the army and the rapid support forces has just spread to new areas. A rebel group in the South Kordofan state broke a long-standing ceasefire agreement and attacked an army unit. Al Janina in West Darfur was also recently hit hard by the escalating conflict. The negotiated truces in many parts of Sudan have fallen through. Prashant from People's Dispatch joins us now with more.
Prashant, can we start with discussing the current situation in Sudan right now? Right. So, Pragya, we know that the fighting broke out on April 15th. This is fighting between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces who are a paramilitary group. But as people have pointed out on Twitter, they're actually the militias which took part in the genocide in Darfur many, many years ago. So, it was those militias which formed the rapid support forces. So, this fighting broke out in on April 15th and we've had at least two major truces uh, since then. One was in the end of May and one was very recently. That is, uh, it ended on the 21st of June, if I'm not mistaken. That's Wednesday, I think. Yes. Right. So, uh, in both these truces, what happened was both the warring parties uh, agreed to com certain commitments. And these commitments were that they would not recoup or, you know, try to escalate the conflict. They would allow the passage of humanitarian aid, etc., etc. But all these commitments seem to have been violated in both these truces. Uh, and uh, if you look, for instance, at our recent article that we published, by, written by our colleague Pawan, the Sudanese Communist Party source who spoke to us makes that point very clear. That right. both these ceasefires were used as opportunities to actually, uh, for, for these both the warring forces to kind of consolidate and regroup. That was really the way in which these ceasefires were used. And so on very expected lines after the ceasefire ended, the fighting broke out. It has kind of been very intense. Uh, now, both for both the warring parties have committed their own sets of crimes. We need to be very clear about that. On the one hand, we know that the Sudanese armed forces has been using the air force a lot. Now, one way in which the Sudanese armed forces, is, uh, let's call it the armed forces, is superior is that it has an air force capacity. So, it has been using this air force a lot to attack what are essentially civilian neighborhoods where the RSF forces have been, right? So, this has been a charge levied against them time and again, and it is pretty clear that they're doing that. If you look at the rapid support forces, on the other hand, they have been accused of a number of crimes, including the murder of the governor of one of the provinces, right. and also the fact that, you know, in instances of loot, violence, even rape for that matter, all of them have been attributed to the rapid support forces. So, both parties, you know, are really escalating over the past nearly two and a half months, really escalating this cycle of uh, violence. I think the, the the number of people who died is probably crossed around a thousand or three thousand, if I'm not mistaken, in fact. And, uh, you know, the fears are that, you know, then this number could be even higher. And uh, a huge number of people injured. I think the number of, uh, you know, the number of refugees has crossed what? 2.5 million, million now. Million, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. And a large part of it is internally displaced, of course, but still a substantial number of people going to countries in the vicinity. Now, uh, this is also dangerous because of the fact that the countries in the vicinity themselves are very poor. So, they are already struggling, but now they have to struggle with the refugee issue as well. Right. So, all this together makes it a very, very violent uh, situation. And I think activists and you know observers there have kind of expressed the fear that uh, this fighting may be allowed to fester, like it has in many countries uh, in uh, the region, for instance, Libya is a prime example of a country which has been in persistent war for many, many years now, right. for 10 years yeah. since NATO and uh, its allies intervened. So, uh, there is a very strong fear that this might kind of be the case in Sudan as well, because of the fact that you know, it seems to be caught in a cycle. On the one hand, there's fighting, then the US and Saudi Arabia countries like that, they sort of bring about a truce. Uh, you know, there are all these high high sounding statements are made, sure. and then fighting breaks out. Right. I think the US itself at least is kind of uh, you know, begin to begun to maintain that it is not uh, seeing a way out of this. So again, there might be other regional attempts which continue, but there is a very stark fear that this fighting could actually uh, go in the long term. Right. So you know that is really a huge concern, and this would be disastrous for a country like Sudan, which is already facing a variety of crises. You know, there is a climate related crisis, the economic crisis, which people have been struggling for, uh, you know, for decades to deal with. All these crises together and put war on top of that. And then what happens is that you have a complete uh, mess, so to speak. And uh, the people responsible for this mess are the leaders of these military forces, the top leadership of these military forces, which unfortunately, these military forces are in power because everyone was happy engaging with them until now. So, That's you know, right. So it's important to remember that, that these military forces were considered key players in Sudan's political scene. Everyone, you know, kept encouraging them and gave them, you know, full legitimacy. And now... These uh, now they now it seems kind of strange that everyone is kind of condemning them or sitting or saying that you know we need peace, whereas these signs were there for the longest time. Right, so you Prashant. know keeping all that together, it's uh, quite a depressing scene I would say uh, overall uh, in Sudan. Also, one must note that the Darfur province has there's been a huge amount of violence there. Uh, it's in some senses very closely linked, but almost on a uh, on a slightly different track. The, a lot of the armed groups which were 
associated with the RSF, for instance, there's been fighting among some of them. Uh, the, the RSF has been very closely involved in the fighting in Darfur. So uh, the rival groups in those regions are now fighting among themselves. Okay. Uh, and this is a, this is a long conflict. We talked about the genocide earlier. This is a long conflict, and now this is again intensified. So another cycle of violence in Darfur as well, which makes it really a very difficult situation there. A lot of the people there are already in uh, internally displaced people camps. They're refugees, basically, uh, internal refugees. So many of these people are at double the risk because of the fact that the fighting has broken out over there. Right. Also reports of fighting breaking out in the Kordofan region, as you said. So all this together, uh, you know, I think multiple conflicts brewing uh, right now within Sudan, all of them connected and a very difficult time indeed for Sudan's people. Right. Uh, Prashant, you mentioned the Sudanese Communist Party. They also said something about how to resolve the problem where the US is not playing a very positive role. And also, why are the peace agreements not holding up to the promise that they held out? Right. Uh, I think two or three things. One is that uh, when we talk about, let's look at the peace agreements first. I mean, yeah. uh, not about the current ceasefires, which have That's right. kind of not worked out. But even earlier, uh, you know, after 2021, which was when Omar al-Bashir was overthrown, there was, uh, an, uh, there was a very clear question before Sudan, which was that in which direction would Sudan go? Right. Would, uh, would the natural direction or logic of the protests which overthrew Omar al-Bashir uh, be accepted. And the natural logic of those protests was that Omar al-Bashir and his military regime would have to be overthrown. There would have to be democracy in Sudan based on the demands of the protests which took place against Omar al-Bashir. Right. right. That is what, that was the natural logic of it. Right. But that natural process was curbed by the fact that the while Omar al-Bashir was overthrown, his regime remained in power. Mm -hmm. And this basically meant that the army and the rapid, rapid support forces, uh, all of these together, uh, took over the regime. So while Omar al-Bashir was gone, his regime remained in power. And these forces worked together with some centrists and right-wing political parties, which also compromised the army. And they basically ran the regime since then, which meant that the protesters on the streets kept demanding something else. And the army and the right-wing political parties had a completely different agenda. Okay. So from 2021 onwards to uh, now, until the war broke out, what the international community, for instance, has done is basically to encourage and promote this agenda of the militia and the right-wing parties, which is uh, of very, let's say, partial reform okay. uh, or, temp or you know, very half-hearted reform in Sudan. It would have meant a democracy where the army was still in control of the economy. It would have, you know, the forms of democracy would have been there, but the power would still have been, uh, been with the vestiges of the old regime, the remnants of the old regime. Right. And uh, this is what everyone was happy with. The international community was happy with. Uh, the UN, the US, all of them kept pushing this agenda because they didn't want any radical transformations in Sudan That's either. Right. Right? Sudan has a very important geopolitical role uh, as far as many of these foreign powers are concerned as well. Uh, it's in a very important region, what is called the Horn of Africa. So, uh, so basically, since this agenda was never allowed to, the agenda of the people was never really allowed to sort of uh, come into practice. What remained was this half-hearted partial reform thing, which is bound to collapse because armies and military regimes don't like to share power with civilians. It's Absolutely. kind of the law everywhere. Right. Wherever the military is a strong force in uh, the government, it is inevitable that within a short time, if some progress is made towards democracy, it is reversed by a coup or, you know, a new army leader comes to power, they take it back. Sure. Right. And that's exactly what has happened in Sudan. Right. Because while they were close to reaching an agreement with the civilian parties, the army, military generals disagreed among themselves and thus this fighting broke out. So I think what we're seeing is uh, the result of, no, this is not say the pro issue of just two individuals, which is the leaders of the army and the rapid support forces. It is not the result of two or three months of differences between them, mm -hmm. which is how the reporting often takes place. That That's right. These two generals had a fallout and so, you know, we're seeing that. This is a result of the two years of failure uh, to uh, or a failure to allow that uh, demands of the people to actually be implemented. So uh, every time the people pushed their agenda, there was repression, there was violence and, you know, the, that was ignored and it was considered as, you know, they were at the most the response was certain statements saying that this is not good, etc, etc. Okay. So I think all this together is really what uh, brought <coughs> Sudan to where it is right now. Like you said, a very unfortunate situation. There are many dimensions to this issue like the Juba peace accords, uh, which, have, which were with various other rebel groups, all of which failed. But I think this is the fundamental, the crux of this crisis is basically the people's demands 
not being accepted. And that is what I think the left has and the progressive sections in Sudan have time and again reiterated. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Prashant, for joining us with that. And that's all we have for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We will see you again on Monday. Until then, you can find more of our work on our website, peoplesdispatch.org, our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and our YouTube channel have more updates. And this show, Daily Debrief, thanks again for watching.